All right, we are recording. Uh, again, welcome everyone. My name is Glenn Thompson, as you see on the screen, hopefully. And uh, we, I've just hit the recording button, so we are recording today's session, which is our practice. Uh, you, in, you can see I've been working and continue to work and have been since the inception uh, as a mentor with Pacific Trading Academy. If you want to find out more about our programs, uh, you have the contact information as you see the website, www.pacifictradingacademy.com. You have the 800 number, 800-339-8588. Peter Newman handles all of the um, admissions and uh, any, uh, he would work as the individual as liaison to me if you want to find out more about what I do, as well as my coworkers, the other mentors, Ken Chow, Mike Bridges, um, Dale Brethauer is on sabbatical. I'm not sure if, what his schedule is and if he's taking students now or not, but uh, certainly Ken and I uh, are, and I think Mike on a limited basis. But in any case, good to be back with you. Today's title is Intermarket Relationships and Current Trades. Oh, let me just, uh, okay. Uh, so let's begin. If you have questions, uh, let's hold them to the end of the presentation. Uh, today should be relatively short. I always say that and always end up talking over, but I only have 12 slides, if I recall, when I completed this uh, the slideshow last night. So normally I have more than 20, but um, I'll hope to keep it succinct and to the point. I, I, I'll start by saying I was talking to someone a few days ago about the market, uh, someone that Peter Newman, again, had referred to me, was interested in what I do and how I do it. And his view, he immediately expressed right off the bat is, well, you know, the stock, the market's going to crash this year. Uh, it's not, we're not going to have a good year for the stock market. And he proceeded to give me his arguments and uh, site components and factors that he felt were, were going to uh, be the uh, uh, the causative agents for uh, declining stock prices. I did some of them. I thought were apparent. Some of them I, I wasn't uh, were new to me. But I did agree with his view. I I do expect overall uh, by the end of the year 2016 to uh, be uh, for there to be considerable pressure on equity prices. Whereas last year this time I was very optimistic. The fifth year of every decade. Uh, tends to be bullish and uh, equity prices overall tend to be bid up. But I say that as an intro to this presentation uh, because it's always interesting to look at um, polarities of events and some of the important relationships and connections that exist between different sectors in our economy, the stock sector, the currencies, uh, energies, commodities, etc. Interest rates are the cost of money, obviously. So that's what this program is about today. I wanted to highlight some uh, uh, obvious and blatant and uh, salient uh, relationships and correlations that are, I've observed, and more to the point, how we can exploit them for profit. Um, from time to time I do this, and I, we have some very interesting arra uh, arrangements uh, setting up between some of the important uh, financial sectors um, presently. Um, I think that the key components coming up in the next quarter, uh, some of which are already beginning and have begun, um, the two major fundamental events, and those of you who uh, have been and attended previous webinars understand that I make most of my, do most of my analysis based on technicals, charts, and price history and timing, timing in particular as a correlate to price, as, a, as an instigator of what the market does. But um, whenever we're talking about intermarket connections, certainly uh, I want to take into account as a, if, if, if as nothing else as a backdrop to what uh, investment decisions we make, fundamental events, the news. Uh, there always will be factors, but there's a lot. I, I, one factor, one component that's present in the economy and in the financial market arena in general in 2016 in the first quarter, which was very omnipresent last year, all throughout 2015, I was, I'm surprised to see it as uh, high and, uh, you know, the hallmark of the year in terms of financial um, market uh, speculation is volatility. I think for the next, right, right now, there are two major events fundamentally. 
Uh, one is coming this weekend. That's on Sunday, the OPEC meeting in Qatar, Doha. Um, and I think energy prices and all of the markets, uh, to the extent they are impacted by the impact of oil and energy in general, uh, will be uh, will be beneficiaries of whatever decisions are made and have been going on, and the uh, ongoings of OPEC and even the non-OPEC producers. Um, next, coming up in June, is a uh, the situation with the European Union um, and the vote. I think for uh, what is it? Whether or not Britain, Great Britain, is going to remain as a uh, participant in the European bloc. So those are the two primary events, and already we're seeing. Uh, large amounts of volatility, uh, the banking sector across the globe. Not, I started to say in Europe, but not just in Europe because to, we are so interconnected again. Um, uh, between these two events in particular, I think those are the two primary kind of pillar fundamental components that are creating the relationship and uh, affecting and impacting the regimes we're seeing in the different sectors. So the slide we have now is just showing that the, the standard, you know, textbook types of relationships: a rising strength, rising U.S. currency, falling commodities because they're priced, you know, especially oil in particular. Bonds tend to rise, stocks tend to rise. Uh, the opposite is the case. And then you can overlay as a nuance of interpretation, depending on whether or not we're going through a period of deflation or inflation. Uh, there tends to be a decoupling of bonds, the, the equity to stock. Uh, or the bond to stock debt to equity uh, relationship, it can adjust depending on the, the particular regime in place. So this kind of sets, if one isn't familiar with this, just as from an intermarket primer standpoint, this is a slide that uh, I've shown many times in previous presentations just as a starting point. Okay, so let's, let me show you the specifics of what I'm looking at. Uh, I always start with the dollar. You know, I always tell people if you're getting into Forex trading, or considering forex um, or currency speculation in general, start from the broadest of premises. You know, I always work down from the bigger picture, the macro to the micro. Um, but I always think of it if you're trying to make decisions in terms of uh, what currencies or what currency pairs or uh, you know what your your generate projections that are meaningful. Always start from the biggest picture, uh, and I always say if you're thinking about it. Ask yourself if a country, if a sovereign state issued stock, its currency, you know, uh, consider that its currency would be its stock. So as the fate of a nation state goes, so too should its currency. That's a starting point. Now that's really a gross approximation, but it's a probably all not all that all not that bad a starting point to kind of gain a consideration as to how you would expect one currencies will fare relative to another currency. And clearly currencies in general the, I don't know, I, I typically think of them in a comparative or relative sense. I don't know that I'm going to derive a, an intrinsic value for a particular currency because we always have to look at it, not in a vacuum, but relative to, uh, you know, what's going on in another currency, especially trading partners. So I start typically from the U.S. dollar. Uh, I could go back a step further and say, well, what's the, you know, fundamentally how should how could one derive a book value for the US the greenback and you look at things like GDP which in turn is a function of uh, consumption investment government spending fiscal policy monetary policy exports imports the difference between you know there are all sorts of formulas uh, I, again I'm, I don't want to focus too much on the fundamentals I just want to throw that out there as a backdrop for your consideration so here we are. Let's go back to the, let's move to the chart. This is a long term going back about four or five years here in the U.S. dollar. Um, you've got some obvious wave structure and it supports my view. Let me just quickly, uh, let me say this. I am bullish the dollar right now, the U.S. currency. Uh, I put, I got long just for those uh, traders and people that I consult. We did a trade yesterday just to talk brass uh, uh, tax here, uh, specifics. I am long the U.S. dollar index uh, from 94.77. I think we just uh, closed a little, a few minutes ago, uh, 94.95. So we're up slightly. But I anticipate in the short term, when I say short term, in the next month or so, continued appreciation in currency in the U.S. Uh, that's consistent with the Fed's policy. Uh, we have stopped the easing, the quantitative easing. We have we began we've seen it in a quarter of a uh, basis, a quarter of a point, a basis point interest rate uh, earlier in the year. 
Um, the Fed uh, last month indicated that they were uh, not going to have a, a rate hike. So the market, there's fluctuation based on uh, Fed speak and Fed policy going on. Uh, and there's fluctuation in any nation's currency, obviously. But uh, overall, I think the tendency fundamentally for the central bank here in the U.S., the Fed, will be to have, we'll, we'll be seeing, you know, we may not, we may not have the velocity with which rates go up and the cost of money increases uh, may be slower, but it's moving in that direction is my expectation. And as a knee-jerk visceral response, we typically see that that tends to bid the, the, the currency up. So I'm bullish the dollar at the moment, and as, as evidenced by my positioning yesterday, we're long from, the, the, I'm long and the traders who follow my signals are long from 94.77 basis the June, uh, the front month contract right now. All right. Um, so that sets the tone based on this relationship right now for, you know, more or less a, for similar periods of time as the dollar rise, I expect falling commodity prices, uh, bond prices. Now here's an interesting relationship because at the moment I'm bearish the bonds as well. Um, interest rates rise, that tends, that's tend, there's tends to be an interest rate uh, inverse relationship between rates and the nominal bond price. So contra in, in contrast or au contraire to this pick this slide, I am bearish the bonds, but I am at the moment for the next week or two bullish stocks. Uh, we got long in stocks just a couple of days ago. I'm long from 2064 the S &P, in the S&P, the June contract. We're at 26, 2076 or 77, I think, just closed, um, the day session closed a few minutes ago. All right, so we're doing well there. So let's go back to what I want to show you. Um, oh, one quick note. Let me, are you, uh, can you guys still see the slides? I want to make sure we've had from time to time. Or, good. Okay, great. Just want to make sure. All right. This is a uh, weekly chart, a continuation of the U.S. dollar. Here's a technical. What Everything I just said from the previous slide is kind of based on some connections and typical correlations uh, based on capital flows and perceptions and so forth. Let's move towards the technical. So this is the weekly continuation of the U.S. dollar. Here's your, this is wave structure, a plausible wave scenario, okay, as to that would support my bullishness in the U.S. currency. If this top here, the recent top you see here at the beginning of last year corresponds to the end of a third wave, all of this stuff in between, you can see the net motion is sideways. That's typical fourth wave behavior. Uh, little uh, qualification here. For those of you who don't, who I just lost, if you're not familiar with Elliott principle analysis, don't worry. Just if those of you, it's not the intent. I just, I know most of you probably are. For any of you who are newcomers to analysis and, and, and some of the models that we use, uh, hold on, I'll come and address any questions related to such at the end of today's presentation. But here is a plausible scenario. If that top, if that recent top we saw at the beginning of last year corresponds to the end of an impulsive third wave of a bull market cycle, I believe that one argument that would support technically my bullish expectations for the U.S. currency is where we are right now. I think this is, if everything from here is the end of a three, I think we are at the, at or near at the end of a fourth. Here's the A, the B, the C, the D, the E, triangle. Any type of triangular type of uh, fourth wave uh, should consist of five waves. We see structure consistent with that wave description or count is all, is all I'm saying. Is that is that definitive? Certainly by no means. Certainly not at all. Would I, would I go along or make a trading decision solely on one relationship? I probably should not, and I would strongly suggest against it. But it do, it is, it is cons, it's in concert with my expectation for a, bidding, a further bidding up of the U.S. currency. If you go back a, a few extra years, I didn't show it. I'm not sure. I can't recall if I have a monthly chart, <clears throat> but you'll see this, you know, from if we just look at this chart, clearly from left to right, the trend is up. We look like there's only one way for this market to go perceptually, and that would be down. But if you go back a few years, I can't. Uh, we'll see in the next few slides if I show it. I don't recall. We much have we the dollar has historically traded at much higher levels. So there's, so that's a reason I expect higher prices at less at least for the next month or so in the U.S. currency. Also notice here. If you can see the bottom, this is the COT, the Commitment of Traders Report. The red line, uh, the, the commercials 
uh, which account for 70 to 80 percent of the participation, the volume in the market, they are they're still bearish, nominally speaking. Look at, but they are decreasingly so from the most of last year through the present. So that's but that's somewhat bullish. It's not bullish, but it's certainly not bearish. Let's put it that way. It's it's only potentially going to help, uh, you know, as a as a factor, as a component that I would expect might uh, to which the dollar would be sensitive and resonate. All right. So that's a technical or wave count argument, at least, for why I'm expecting appreciation in the U.S. currency. All right. Huh. Moving on. Let's see if I can. Next slide. This is just a, a more uh, myopic, a, a more uh, higher resolution or greater granularity. This is the daily chart of the U.S. dollar. That was the weekly. Here is the dollar on the daily. And part of the reason in my decision making, this was printed out yesterday's uh, uh, market, so it doesn't show. But I had, here's an RSI, uh, standard RSI oscillator. Uh, and I timed when the market, this is a zone, some bottoms connecting. When we broke through the support, moving in the direction that my broader term analysis, things like the Elliott wave, things like my market timing indicated, in conjunction with that RSI crossing above oversold, 20, uh, that was part of the uh, facts, part of the information set that I considered uh, that I felt was in aggregate sufficient to uh, pull the plug and pull the trigger, rather, on going long and establishing a long position. So we did again. We got long at 94.77. Uh, if one is on the sidelines, do, you know, question people. I, I often get feedback from the webinars I do uh, pertaining to specific campaigns that I've launched as position trades and some people not having entered in it exactly the same way at exactly the same time that I have often request is it a still an appropriate trade in this case for varying reasons I believe so I expect we're going to have continued further appreciation uh, from a time perspective at least the next couple of weeks so uh, and then time indirectly uh, allows me to establish proportionally where I might expect from a price vantage point the market to go. All right. So that's just more of a, that's the daily chart of the U.S. dollar. Interest rates. This is the bond. This is the uh, daily June bond contract. Uh, two points I wanted to highlight. The cost of money. Uh, this is the bonds. It's an indirect way of looking at uh, the cost or the value of money in a sense. But what's important is notice the red line down below here. That's the commercials. Notice that they are extreme. They're at their most extreme bearish net short position that they've been in for the last uh, however many months this is, six, seven, whatever it is, since back in October. They have at no point since last October been had, had uh, on the books a, as large a net short position as they have currently. So all the while, the market's been rising. So, but that is ostensibly very uh, bearish. So that's consistent. Remember I said I am bearish the bond market at this point. I expect uh, the pol to the extent the market expects the Fed to continue with a policy of raising rates and the overwhelming majority of market participants, as evidenced by this line, thinks that that's the case. For, or for whatever reason, they expect bond prices to decline, nominal bond prices, which is consistent with a, a rising, uh, a, a more of a, a, a stringent, uh, conservative, uh, you know, raising rates, further rates. If we were, I know we'll have at least one more rate increase before the end of 2016, and that will tend from a capital flow standpoint to put pressure on non, on bond prices. From a technical standpoint, you know, I didn't fill in, this would be one, this would be two, three, if you can see that in this top here, the highest price we see on the chart is the end of a fifth wave of a bull market set of the cycle, of a, of a cycle. Now, here it gets a little, uh, I'm not sure. You know, there are a couple of plausible wave descriptions or counts, as it were, that are consistent with theory. Is everything from the top on the bond chart right here, where I have number five, if that's the end of the fifth wave, uh, it's the start of a bear market ABC pattern. Either you know, I'm not sure. Is You could make a case that this bottom here is the A, this top is the B, and this is the C. That's why I have C, little c there. There's no, uh, by the way, folks, I, don't, I must have had my hand on the capital, uh, the shift key or something. I don't, uh, there's no reason why this should is capital versus this is small case. That's just, I don't know, that's just something, a, a vestige of whatever my finger was doing on the keyboard. So don't make anything of that. But my point is this, this bottom here, plausibly 
I, I'm seeing it, it's certainly a pivot point bottom, which could either be the end of the entire ABC three-wave correction, the end of the bear market, and, and if so, that mean that would mean that I would be thinking, and the, the cause as to why the market moved up to this obvious pivot point a few days ago at the beginning of the week or end of last week, uh, would be the end of that in first impulsive bull move, in which case I would expect lower prices, given the price action for the last, uh, since Monday. All right? That would be a correction wave two. In other words, if this top is a wave one, it's the, the reason uh, from an Elliott wave pr uh, perspective, I would expect falling bond prices, the market's forming the correction wave two, consistent with a bull cycle. That would be one reason. Alternatively, if this bottom here is just the end of an A, this top here would be a B, in which case I would expect the market to go down to form the final leg of the bear market, the C. So in either case, those are two plausible cases. Are there any possible alternate uh, wave counts? I'm sure that there are, but those are two obvious ones that stick out to me. And in either case, even though they're differ different scenarios, different wave counts entirely on the surface, they both augur and suggest the same type of price action. So there is one factor, completely separate, having nothing to do with what the commercials are thinking. The commercials are, for whatever reason or reasons, extremely bearish. So that's bearish. If it weren't, it would still, uh, we still have this uh, structure in price, which overwhelms and discounts everything. And I expect further declines in bond prices. Um, I, um, so that's a uh, situation there. All right. This is just a uh, if-then scenario chart that comes from the intermarket uh, slide that was the first slide we showed. If bonds go down, then I expect rising uh, currency, oil to go down, the metal, precious metal sector, and stocks go down. If alternatively bonds rise, uh, it, uh, these are just the connection charts based on as a where the uh, um, uh, depend independent variables, the bonds as opposed to the U.S. currency, and in the other markets would be the dependent markets as a function of what bonds do. So, if ri falling bond prices, uh, you have what we see here, rising bond, nominal bond prices, uh, then we see this. So certainly right at this moment, I'm, I'm favoring real, a set of uh, trajectories for the respective sectors uh, that more closely is going to mirror the left side of this screen. Um, bullish the dollar, uh, bull bearish oil, um, bearish the metals. The only thing right now, I'm, I'm long in the stock, so there is a, a, a nuance of, of separation there. But other than that, uh, certainly most of the, the relationship as evidenced on the left side of the screen is what I'm looking at. This is gold. Uh, this is, here we have a wave count in gold. I'm currently out of gold. I was short uh, a few weeks ago and we got stopped out, but we did very, we got short at like 1266 and got out 1226 area. But here's your one, two, here's your three. You have a rising wedge, typical fifth wave. And then everything since the top here that I've designated is uh, number five in this cycle is either an A, B, or it's an A, B, C that ended here, and we're in a, a, a two. This top, the recent top a couple of days, uh, uh, two days ago, would be the end of, say, the initial bull market wave one, possibly a wave two. Suffice it to say, regardless, similar to what we just saw on the bond chart, I expect bearish metal prices uh, for the next week or so at least going, you know, possibly out in, you know, another month or so. Um, and that's going to, I'm going to have, I'm going to kind of tie specifically my expectations in the precious metal sector, gold, silver, platinum, et cetera, to the stock market, because one of the trades I want to highlight coming up very soon, for which I have a high probability of, ex, of uh, expected, atta you know, attaching expectations to, is going to intimately tie into the precious metal sector. So I'm going to come back to this. But right now, if I were positioned in gold, it would be short. Uh, gold today came down. I think we settled at 12.27, just above 12.27.10 or so in that area. So we big move down. If one is, I'm not short. I'm out of it. I we made money a, a few weeks ago in the short side. But if I were positioned in gold. That's not one of the trades I have at the moment, I, uh, but I would be embracing the short side of gold. And here's the technical factors here. We've got, uh, again, now here's going back a year, the commitment of traders. This is a yearly chart on the gold, on the daily chart, but notice the extreme. We are at the largest net short on the part of the commercials uh, here. Uh, so extremely bearish profile. 
uh, on the, as evidenced and reflected by the uh, positioning on the largest participants in the market as reflected by the red line here, the commercials. And that's consistent with my the inner market correlations I'm, I'm seeing and aware of and highlighting and the technical wave uh, count that I think the two most pos possible and uh, ones that make the most sense. That's gold. All right. Big picture in oil. This is a 25 year shot of oil. And this is, this is textbook. Uh, everything up to the, you know, from the bottom here back in whenever this was, back in the 90s, 98, 1998, this is, you can make, you can see their set of, their structure consistent with five waves going up to the all-time high here uh, in crude oil. And then everything since is a classic bear market, three waves. A is this bottom here between, I don't have the, uh, looks about 2009, that's the end, you know, where it went into free fall, that's a classic A. And then you have a B. B waves clear, you know, the highest frequent, look at this triangular structure. This is the market. This is perfect textbook Elliott wave. The, the second highest frequency of location for you to see convergent or triangular structures is in a B wave. So this is, in a long-term view, we're, we're seeing Elliott wave principle uh, attributes of the model manifest in the oil market. There's your classic triangle. Here's your A, B, C. D, E, or, or wherever it is here, you, you can see that you, if you connected the lower tops and simultaneous rising bottoms, you obviously have a horizontal serpentine type uh, triangular structure. And that's your B wave. All of this up to wherever you want to end it, in, it ends in time over here. It ends at price up here at the most extreme at a, over $110 per barrel. Suffice it to say, everything from this top from the price perspective to this bottom at $30 or just uh, just right there at the $30 mark, marks the end of what I believe is the long-term generic bear market in oil. So longer term, I'm bullish oil. As evidenced by the last, uh, this is a monthly chart, the last two months, you can see. I believe that would correspond to the start of what would be a long-term bull market in oil. But remember, this is a monthly chart. We're showing, we're seeing 25 years of activity, a big picture. That's typically where I want to start. So, and it's classic, it doesn't get more perfectly uh, reflected in a graphic, uh, you know, sense to illustrate the veracity and the accuracy of something like the Elliott Principle in the, as, as, oil, as the oil market history is shown here. Okay, the oil entry. This is the, uh, the trade that I want to talk about the most today uh, from a practical standpoint based on the intermarket correlations I'm citing. Um, as well as the technicals. Um, so first let me just talk about what's going on here technically. Notice this bottom right here. I, this horizontal line uh, is, is an important, it reflects the level of uh, its, what is it, 42, uh, 75 area or whatever that is, 41, how are we, break? I forgot the number, but it's, you can see the top here we had, this is the daily chart of of May oil. I did the trade yesterday, or actually, I'm I haven't done the trade, excuse me, in oil. I'm looking, I'm working orders, actually early this morning at uh, like 1 or one, 1 o'clock, 12.31 a.m. Pacific time, I placed an order to sell oil in the June contract at 41.12 stop, good till canceled. So those who are a consult and work with and teach and so forth, who are on, get the, the signals that I send out, and those of you who are listening to the presentation today, I've just said that I am currently working orders. I just placed it like at 12.30, quarter to 1 a.m. this morning with an idea. I, don't ex I didn't expect it really to get filled today, but uh, I am certainly expecting pressure on oil prices and further declines immediately in the next few weeks here. At le well, here's the idea. I've got the order working this shorted at 41.12, basis to June, and in part, here's why. Look at this, we're at, it, it's what Gann said and others like him. When time and price converge, when they run into each other, that's where you have your best value areas. That's the market's way of locating for you, uh, an observer that's not asleep at the wheel, paying attention. When time and price collude, collide, as I expect they will. So, here's the bottom, perfect bottom perfectly correspond. It's not coincidence that this little top here, this recent top, uh, what was that, March 18? I actually sold oil the day after based on a time target. I, I, I deleted that vertical line 
uh, for because this is what's more important, the yellow line, because it's t uh, April 15 is tomorrow. That yellow line, that's why I want this date. That's what's important. To me, that's most important pertaining to this market. More important than the price. Yes, price discounts everything, but the reason it does, if you have a mindset similar to uh, what I carry or bring to the table in, in analysis, is certain time periods. So I, just based on recent analysis in the last 24 hours, I projected a time point 415, which happens to be tomorrow. This blue line is the 18th. So I got two dates coming up with a, a uh, frequency great, you know, uh, that caused me to pique my, it piqued my interest, my curiosity. Is this coincidence or, you know, and they're relatively close. If we discount and take out Saturday and Sunday for which, you know, partial activity on Sunday, they're one and the same is what I'm saying. That's a time cluster. I find that very interesting. What I find of as a, almost as equally interesting is the fact that the high here is kind of right up. It's basically a few points or ticks away from that top, which is all came about because of that historical bottom back in uh, August or September, whenever that was. History tends to, um, you know, historical action tends to catapult itself or export it into the future, and it has similar, exerts similar effects on the future price action. So we've got market moving into a price resistance zone at a time resistance point. And when that, when time and price come together, get ready for a reaction. Typic, uh, one type of reaction, albeit not the only, is a trend reversal. So in terms of establishing or, you know, my argument for a, a short on oil, technically is I've got price and time colluding to push, and, you know, they're coming into this wall in time and, and, and price. Uh, in a space-time continuum, if you will, I expect a reversal to occur. Um, now, to the ex there's always the chance that this thing could blow through that resistance, in which case I would be wrong directionally, and I'd have to acknowledge such. You know, I don't want to buck the trend, but uh, I doubt that. This is a classic example of, you know, buy the rumor, sell the, sell the news from a fundamental standpoint. Uh, also, re just I, I think I mentioned uh, in the opening statement, the components fundamentally that are going to shape the immediacy of what's going on in the world and in, and and in, and secondarily and tertiarily, uh, the financial sector. What's going on this week, this Sunday? I think it, it's in um, the OPEC meeting. So the reason that the you know the CNBC and the financial network pundits have said that the market was bid up this week was there was apparently, uh, if you believe this, it, it was a token gesture. I guess the Saudis and the Russians came to get this a deal or an agreement or a consensus of view where they're going to have a production freeze. Notice what I, let me, this is fundamental guys. I, I'm not a fundamentalist, but I had a chuckle when I hear this, a production freeze. Notice I did not say, normally when you're talking about oil, we talk about increases or cuts. Those are the two bywords we often hear with oil fund, traders who are talking fundamentals. That was, it was, that was not the verbiage or language. The narrative earlier this week was the Saudi Arabia and Russia agrees to a freeze. How convenient. <laughs> Essentially, they've done nothing. But, it's, but the market, you know, to the vis-a-vis -vis the classic, uh, it's a market maxim, if you will. Buy the rumor, sell the news. I, I was telling traders that I consult during the week, and all last week I should be long oil as the market continued to etch, ebb its way up, buy the rumor. And so what, where are you going to really, you think you made money on the long side in oil going up, we're really going to, all I can say is we've got technicals in place. We've, we're, when I put on the trade, we're just because I'm heard that uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia has agreed to a quote unquote, I've got to chuckle production freeze, where essentially they're not doing anything, but they will get the benefit they can continue to maintain whatever modicum of market share they choose, all the while putting pressure on those non-OPEC producers vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., where the which, by the way, the U.S., in the latest stuff I, I keep up on, because I used to trade oil in particular years ago when I was working on Wall Street, uh, U.S. oil rig count, I think, was down last week by eight rigs. So U.S. shale production is down. 
So essentially that on, a, on the world barrel level uh, cuts, we, we are cutting production, but OPEC doesn't need to cut production. The Saudi oil minister doesn't need to, as a procedural policy uh, mandate, uh, indicate any need to put, cut production. But by a mere acquiescence between Russia and the Saudis to say they're going to freeze production. There is an expectation for the last six months there's been an excess of over 300 million barrels put into storage worldwide. All the while the ec economists are saying there's still projected a, a decline in global growth. You do the math. And this is not even how I make my trading decisions. But as a backdrop fundamentally, I think the trade of the weak folks is to short oil. That's the that's why I wanted to highlight this. If I didn't if you were not aware, if I was not aware, if one was not aware of any of the shenanigans going on with the Saudis and OPEC, uh I, I forgot to mention what's going on with Iran. Now that the sanctions are are, are being lifted, they are they're not their their impetus is to increase production. Isn't that convenient? Isn't the cozy relationship between the Iranians and the Russians, uh, in order to for Russia to continue to get paid for their supplying of Iran to rebuild Iranian armaments, they need, Iran needs to uh, continue to increase output so as to generate revenue sufficient to cover the cost of the Russian armament. Oh, this is an interesting you know circles upon circles. But in any case, if one didn't know that. And certainly, going back to what I do, here's what's important. I, I always like to reverse engineer policy. What I mean by that, it, it, I am no, it's, I'm going to need, it's almost blasé, I'm going to need to have it become more difficult to predict policy and fundamental events for, start without knowing what they are, but instead figuring it out backwards by seeing what the charts tell you. This is the beauty of the technical approach, folks. This is not coincidence. It would be if it were just singular every now and then more than the now. But you have critical, this markets, this level stopped on a dime. Okay, at that point, I didn't know the significance. But when the same top is achieved in March, I think that was March 18th, if I recall. And then again, two days ago, basically, within a tick, couple of ticks, and at a time that I projected, We've got a very high probability scenario. Something's going to happen in the next few sessions. Isn't it convenient that on Sunday, this Sunday, April 17th, OPEC meets in uh, Qatar? So stay tuned. That's the trade. That's from in terms of the most explosive opportunity for dollars and cents return. This is it right here. This is the freebie, guys. Okay, it's, you know, everyone, uh, am I saying that I'm expecting uh, oil to, you know, are we going to be in $20 a barrel oil? No, I think by the end of the year, we'll be much higher. But in the next, the trade right at the moment, the, the, the purpose of this webinar is to point out this is the inter-market inter opportunity at the moment, trade of the week as it were. Now let me move the slide along. Okay, I'll come back to oil in a second. This is just to illustrate. This is a this is the stock market because it's all related, you know. Oil declining oil price. How I you know fundamentally. If I didn't, I I started as a fundamentalist. If I didn't know fundamentals, fortunately, I could you could still make money just on the charts alone. Here's the uh, uh, where are we? This is the S and P. Uh, this is this little. All these trend lines are enabling. These are technical uh, relationships and clever tricks we use to generate data. But 422, April 22. Anyone who's been listening to any of the webinars I've given in the last few months, and I haven't. Usually I do one a month. Uh, in the last this year, I haven't done as much for varying reasons. But anyone who's listened to me or heard me or anyone that I consult knows April 22nd is the most critical date coming up in the stock market, uh, I've given, I'm going to give that about a 90% uh, probability of, of uh, impacting in uh, uh, the equity sector, the S&P, or any equity, any major equity market in the U.S. 422. Keep that date in mind if you haven't already. Previously, last week, I had April 6. I only gave that about a 67, 70%, but it, it's it's greater than average probability, and we're seeing the uh, response by the market, I believe. So overall, my expectation for stocks 
it's, you know, very often people will ask the easier question, where, what's my price target? Well, that's very easy to generate. Textbooks are filled of, of techniques and relationships, Fibonacci, harmonics, whatever, by which you can project price targets. I would rather give you a, a sense. The run time for this market, how long do I expect the, market, the stock market to run up? Between now and next Friday, April 22nd, this vertical line right here, that's important. How, so from a proportionality standpoint, and I know that's an indirect because markets are not Newtonian purely linear. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, but it's typically a hybridization of type, different types of linear and admixture of nonlinear price action. But more or less I get a sense as to the runtime. So this uh, area between April 22nd, I'm also getting some stuff the following Monday, but it's at a critical window for which I expect we're going to see uh, a change in the behavior of the equity sector on or about April 22nd, which again is next Friday to keep you keep you in mind of the calendar, folks. So that's my projection for the stocks. Okay. Curiously, it you know one could conceive of all sorts of underlying fundamental uh, events that could conspire and come together to bring about. There will always be an event or series of events that serves as a topical level of, of, of that makes perfect sense to the pundits after the fact. These things always make perfect sense after the fact in retrospect as to why something happened. So, you know, uh, falling energy prices, if oil continues to decline in the way that I expect, and it might be that the meeting this Sunday when it comes out that there's they can't reach an accord uh, between the OPEC and non-OPEC producing nations, uh, that oil prices collapse, let's say. So, uh, the oil, the energy sector's uh, primary organ companies, corporate entities, are not going to be able to service the, uh, the the loans from the big banks uh, globally, and that cuts into the profit margins of the banks, weighing on stock prices. So there you have it. There you have the the series of interconnected possible uh, 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 chain of events that could bring about uh, for a stock uh, decline based on falling energy prices. The falling energy prices cuts into the profit margins of the energy companies, which in turn uh, makes it more difficult for them to service the debt that the big banks and the bank stocks decline and so on and so forth, and it cascades. All right. If you didn't know any of that, the charts and the analyses that we use, whether it's Elliott, anything from A to Z, is probably going to do you better service. But for me, again, those of you who've attended my previous seminars, these vertical lines, um, for which I may have a number of different approaches, uh, primarily GAN stuff, uh, different cycles that I look at, will indicate turning points in time. Again, citing the principle that people like GAN, Jensen, Wyckoff, Robert Miner, Robert Krauss, etc., more recently Michael Jenkins, Larry Presidento, some of my teachers have indicated, uh, market's going to do what it's going to do once its time has come. So when specific amounts of elapsed time have uh, have ticked off the proverbial clock, clock, as it were, then and only then will you have more pronounced moves from which you can extract uh, a considerable edge of return. All right. This is the commitment of traders for the stock market. And this is going back a year. I think the previous slide, this is just a daily chart of the stock market and showing graphically this this is next Friday so keep that in mind 422 that's will I get out then what am I saying and 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 by the way this horizontal is just my crosshairs it's not meant to be a, a price target it might be but uh, not I can easily work out a price target what's more important to me traders ask me all the time when are you gonna get out half the time 75% of the time I enter a trade I have no idea when I'm gonna where I'm gonna get out at a price I could that's easy in the scheme of analysis to work out price target projections, if you think you're in a fifth wave, we typically understand it's 62% of one through three, and, and allowing and then take off a quarter to 50% in allowance for truncation and things like that. And then when you confirm it by alternate uh, approaches, there are all sorts of methods. That's that's easier to do. Much more interesting and much more reliable is to generate price tar uh, time targets that give you an indication as to potential run times, then you can have more concrete evidence as to plausible price levels or ranges to which you would expect within that window of time the market can achieve. You see? 
and look for convergences and uh, alignments to occur. This is the just a uh, the commitment of traders that supports it. Here's your one, your two, your three, and this is a four. And so we're going up based on, from a wave standpoint, a fifth wave. But what's more important, that was the, the previous chart illustrates that, if you see. That's the daily chart. What I, this slide shows is a completely different idea. Look at the commitment of traders. All of the naysayers, in spite of whatever potential dark clouds or storm clouds loom on the horizon as far as the, our, our country is concerned, uh, politically, um, economically, um, whatever, in spite of it, at least uh, for the commercials, the people that control the, vo the, vo the volume that are responsible for pushing 70 to 80 percent of the volume of what's going on, they're bullish. Look at this red line. Curious. So that's an argument. They can effectively move the markets by virtue of their positions. They are at their, let's see, for the last year, the current commercial position is at the largest net positive, net long position. So that is very bullish by itself. What amplifies and exacerbates, what it makes it even more significant is the blue line, which is the small traders are almost, not exactly, but they're in a very atypical position. I tell this to the traders I consult all the time. Normally, you have a mirror image relationship between whatever it is positioning from a COT perspective the commercials are doing, this red line, and the green line. That's institutional hedge funds, big institutional money. They tend to be at odds because the commercials tend to be a preview, a harbinger of events in the market to come. Usually, it could be three to six months. That's the that's the catch in in this type of analysis. That's why I don't you don't place trades solely on COT data itself. It's just one component of a of an analytical argument, let's say. But here's what's interesting: why I felt compelled and why this is an interesting slide to include in this program. The notice the kind of mirror, antipodal motion of the blue line, which are the small specs. Those are traders that on average do less, or on any given entry, do less than 100 contracts. So it's merely a question of size and, and capital capability, funding, resource level. Okay, But they are opposite. Why is, why is it that that's significant? Well, 85 to 90% of the time, the blue line is wrong. So whatever they're doing, if it happens to be the opposite, which it is, very, and that's le that happens less, that's only occurring about 15% of the time, that's, that further confirms the veracity, the probability of being correct for whatever it is that the commercials are doing. Well, they're net long, and they are at their extreme most net long that they've been in for the, since last May, going back on the left side of the screen. I've, would I, is that guarantee the market's going to go up? No but combined with other factors. I could cite, you know, uh, evidence of the U.S. economic recovery, strong job gains in the last few months, uh, rising home prices or real estate in the, in the uh, residential market. Uh, I could cite the, the market itself as its own best arbiter of where it's most likely to go. The stock, what's the stock market doing? That serves as to some, for some, as an economic indicator. Not me. I just, you know, there's no such thing to me as a bad market or a good market. I know what people mean, but I'm thinking of it from the mindset of a trader. Money, percent return, ROI on, you know, re, where's my return coming? It doesn't matter. But if I want to build a case for a certain uh, expected uh, trajectory for a financial market, you certainly have evidence. So I'm expecting this to uh, maintain and persist through next Friday, the 22nd, after which uh, time will have run out, and then it's time for the market. When time runs out for a particular financial uh, instrument regime, then a new regime will onset. An old one dies out, and an, allowing for the uh, onset of an, uh, an alternative idea and an alternative course. We're shifting, we're tacking, as it were, in financial markets parlance. All right, so this is my argument for why I'm long. Again, we got long a couple of days ago in the stock market at 2064. We settled just uh, uh, 45 minutes ago, whatever time it is now, at 115 Pacific, about an hour ago, or uh, 45 minutes ago, at 2077 or so, I think. So we're already doing well, and I expect further appreciation. Okay, but that's but that's going to set up. If you ask someone asked me yesterday, what will I be going short 
on or around the uh, end of next week. Yeah, I'll be thinking, at least that's my thought now. Now, if conditions change, I'll adjust. But that's the next major trade. That's the trade for next week. And how long would I expect that will last? Well, my time progression for the equity sector in the United States, again, last week, April 6th, was an important date, not as important as some of the dates, and nowhere near as important as what I expect and uh, believe 422 will uh, exert in terms of its impact on the, on the equity sector. And subsequent to that, May 3rd, not as important. I'd give that about 80%. But the next one similar in importance that I've already projected out for the stock market, June 12th. Now, that's a Sunday. Whenever you, I project time targets that happen to fall on a day when the market's not trading, although Sunday the, yes, it opens up half day or so, uh, but it's not, you're not going to have much going on probably, but you look at the next the surrounding dates, Monday. So think about June 12th, 13th. That's something of significance. I don't know what. I don't know if it will correspond to a top or a bottom, but I do. Uh, I can tell you right at this juncture today, something over 90% sure the market's going to shift on or around the 12th, 13th, uh, let's say the 13th, because that's the Monday, the next major full session. We'll see. I mean, so we'll see. So we'll put all these things together. But this slide, again, is an argument based on this relationship down here. If I didn't have the other factors, the time, oh, I went, yeah, if I didn't have all of this stuff, which is told me to go long, and uh, all of the other uh, technical components in this perfectly comes in. I've got this intersection of these two lines as a time point, 422. That's certainly, that's one idea, but I have other factors, both cyclical, numerical, geometric, and uh, trend at standard ten technical analysis telling me 422. And the following Monday is also important, but a, essentially the epicenter of what I'm expecting change is on or around the 22nd. You see, okay. And then completely different is this COT data. Okay. This is the trade of the week. This is just a finer, this is the oil chart. Uh, so if you want to, the takeaway for the moment is to go short oil. You know, here's just a daily, uh, this is the hourly chart, excuse me, of the June, oh, it's the, I, the May. You know, I realized, folks, when I was doing the presentation, uh, I, I, for, after I put the slideshow together yesterday evening, I realize that we're, you know, the oil contract, the expiration calendar is such that we're, I don't do anything in the May contract, and it was too late to, I had everything put together, and uh, it was just too late to, to kind of uh, redo. But if you're trading this, trade in the June or, or go out to July. We don't want to do May because it's going off next week, okay? But the structure geometrically is the same. You kind of, on the hourly chart, have a nice rising wedge type structure, which is a high correlation with trend reversal. Um, these lines mean something. This intersection is a point of reversal corresponding. But again, go remember, my time point for oil is tomorrow. And we are up, this uh, yellow line is a, an area of resistance. That's the same. Remember, let me go back to that previous slide. This is the chart that sets, creates the analytical setup for why I'm going short. Are there other factors in case anyone's asking? Yes. But these are the ones that are most prominent in my, based on what I believe is important as a checklist of uh, relationships that I feel are, are congruent and consistent with markets shifting and making moves worth my while uh, in dollars and cents metric. This bottom here, evidence showing up again as a top two times, March 18th and yesterday, or whenever that, yeah, yesterday's action. That's not coincidence. Adding, you know, insult to injury, adding fuel to that fire, Three times the price has come in basically to the same point, but if that alone might be sufficient, but what further intrigues me and what ser serves to suggest a higher possible uh, move and response is the fact that it's coming in so proximal to this time point, yet tomorrow, the yellow line. That's when you pay attention. And then if that were not enough technically, and by the way, if we've got the, the, we've got the uh, commitment of traders situation where the, the commercials are extremely bearish, and, and then as a potential, you know, uh, if, uh, falling in line with buying the rumor, selling the news, we've got the, the news coming out this Sunday. How convenient. Almost too convenient. So I got it. That's, that's why, uh, again, folks, I, am, I think I mentioned I, am, I put the order in 1230, quarter to 1 a.m. Pacific time. So in case I, you know, I'm missing something, I have to, I'm always, I am constantly in troubleshooting mode trying to figure out what I'm, 
missing. It's not what I'm aware of that concerns me. It's what I'm not considering. It's almost too easy. But again, after, you know, that's where the importance of money management comes in. This is the hourly chart of the May contract. Again, if you're going to do a trade in the futures and the derivative, do not do May. It's going to expire next week. So trade in June or July, let's say, as long as it's liquid. So what I've done is I've required that the market prove itself by placing, I'm, I've am i worked my sell stop at 41.12. In case you're asking, where do I get that number? All sorts of calculations, numerical and arithmetic, based on where support and resistance are. Far enough below so that it would require something more than intraday volatility to inadvertently get my triggered short uh, prematurely on the one hand, but not so far as to miss too large a percentage of the move should it, in retrospect, prove to be uh, profitable. So, but in principle, the details of which, you know, I talk to the traders that I consult. But for those of you hearing the presentation today, I want you to see at least some of the, the uh, inner market considerations and the trade right now that uh, arises out of this um, is, I think, a very high probability setup for a good situation here. Any questions, folks? Again, Peter Newman, Head of Admission, Pacific Trading Academy, 800-339-8588. He's the person you would want to talk to. Um, I think I'm, for once, holding true to my word. I, I think we're at that hour point, and I have time. Uh, written, uh, that's it uh, for today. Normally, I go overboard and have a lot more slides. You know, right bef five minutes before I got online with you guys, I thought of some other things I was going to that I felt would embellish and uh, deliver the points that I wanted to deliver and, and uh, convey more convincingly. Uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, the, an idea popped into my mind about how uh, so many things seem random, uh, but as traders, at least it, the analytical parts of what we do, we're always looking for determinacy amidst the randomness. The random the features that are random, random, random activity, random phenomena is very, uh, very scarce in the scheme of, the, of things in our world, I find. Usually, if you look close enough, there are correlations and patterns that create structure underlying random, what appears to be purely random activity. There are some things that are random, I believe, but more often than not, if we, depending on to the, you know, the how deeply we look, we can often identify patterns of, of that indicate determinacy and um, you know uh, it's good that we have the random components because they create the volatility that's essential to uh, um, creating cha price translation for which we need for for trends to develop um, so anyway I was going to I was going to I, I thought of presenting in the slide the those of you who've uh, seen some of my recent presentations may be familiar with the chaos game where you have the Sierpinski triangle and how you roll a die and no matter, you know, the out, you know, when you roll a die, that's pure chance and that's the random component. But in spite of that, we see uh, events and phenomena and financial markets adhering and being responsive to purely deterministic, uh, what I call uh, tractors. There are certain attractors in that are at very deep levels and I believe the timing this is why I believe theoretically timing is so uh, helpful uh, to traders uh, it, they are somehow sensitive to these attractors that ultimately at very deep levels they're immune to the superficial changes you know the news from day to day you know one day we find that you know uh, more people jo uh, jobs reports uh, jobless claims have increased the next week or the next month jobless claims increase that's the vagaries and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the frequency with which these superficial topical events change is amazing and it makes it difficult if you were to, at least impossible for me, if I were to try and be profitable in my trade solely on fundamentals. This is why when you dig deeper and locate you know, the core foundational uh, concepts and attractors, if you will, that I feel are more permanent and exhibit a constancy regardless of the ebb and flow of superficial market motion, you get a, uh, you're going to see results ebb up and increase to uh, improve your trading results. Any questions, guys? Is the correlation between oil and stocks still strong? Yes, very, a in a manner that I think I mentioned. Um, the headline article on ZeroHedge.com is Iran's massive oil fleet begins. I am not surprised. I was, thank you. Uh, Carries or oh Frank oh yeah 
hey, uh, Carestasy, yeah, I am not surprised. Uh, news will, you know, if it weren't that, if it weren't an, a, a, an article, that if it weren't that specific event, it would be something else. Because the, mar the news will always, the news and the events, what traders who focus primarily on fundamentals refer to as the catalysts that make their decisions, there will always be some event or series of events that brings about what I believe on the deeper levels, the charts, let's say, have already pointed to. The charts just don't tell you explicitly. The news report in the, in the Wall Street Journal or Investor's Business Daily or on the CNBC or, 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 or financial Yahoo Finance uh, website or whatever the website is, that will always kind of simultaneous or after the fact, in which case I got to think it's, you know, a more appropriate classification or narrative is it's not news, it's history. You know, to what extent is that going to be helpful? It's always other than, in, you know, I like, like anyone else, I like discussing current events, but ask yourself the practical question, to what extent are the current events going to materially and consistently in an objective way help you be profitable in your speculative efforts? Uh, everyone's aware to the extent they can tap into a website, you know, in 2016 and be, get up to speed on the current news. You know, 20, 30 years ago, you'd have to have a subscription to the journal or Barron's or, or, or IBD or whatever the media was. Times change, but, you know, condition, you know, there is nothing new under the sun in Solomon. History tends to repeat. Uh, they, you know, the, the infrastructure with which the critical events are posited and presented for our per, our collective uh, view may be more elegant and uh, elaborate, but more or less at the end of the day, it's the same old uh, story. History, t you know, things tend to go around, recapitulate. Yeah, so I'm not, thank you for that information. Zerohedge.com, Iran's massive oil fleet begins to move 29 million barrels to part in the, yeah, I mean, energy. If I'm Iran and I've just had sanctions released, I want to get, I, my objective is to make as much money as I can. So, yeah, they're going to be a thorn in the side of uh, OPEC because they're looking to uh, increase production, not cut or even freeze. How can be, I have to, I cannot help but stop laughing when the world thinks possibly, the, how do I know for that the world thinks that? Look at the price of oil last week. It went up. So they're, they're being optimistic if they expect the price of oil to keep. Now, I'm not saying we won't. I remember I said, folks, I expect longer term. You know, by the end of the third, the end of the third, fourth quarter, we will be at higher energy prices, but more uh, overriding regime changes need to occur. I don't, uh, there, there needs to be a rebalancing of the energy sector. So the trade of the week and for the next few weeks, I expect lower energy prices. And we've got a, com we've got a complete fundamental and technical and time recipe for such. And that's what I'm setting up. If conditions change, and I monitor this moment by moment, I will adjust. I'd be a fool not to. But given the situation at hand, that's what I'm expecting. Great. Any other questions, folks? Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm, let me back up. Oh, maybe. Uh, oh, okay. Let me just see here. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, for that oil fleet information about Iran. I'm not surprised, but thank you for that. Private, I'm not receiving your trades. Uh, please add me to your alerts and call me when you have time to talk about getting mentoring. Jim Brake. Okay, Jim. Thank you. I and by and guys, if I have been I if anything, and I'm gonna focus the microscope on me, point out my flaw, I get backed up sometimes. Not sometimes, it's my norm. I I need you just bear with me. Keep Utilize for that, and Jim and you and everyone else. The the uh, what's my mother used to tell me? The uh, squeaky wheel gets the oil. Keep pestering me. I don't mind it at all. It don't please do not take it personal. If there is a too long a period of time. My hardest. I just you know I wake up every morning. I got 20 emails, and everyone says oh, I got a simple question. Is I got two questions, but each question has 10 parts. A, B, C, D, and E. So to do justice, it just these things. A lot of these things to do it correct are a little time very time intensive, not a little sometimes to do it other than being cursory about it. Okay. Uh, let's see here. What, what other, uh, thank you for that information. They'll record it at the office and I can get back to you. Will U.S. frackers begin to, 
Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, it, I don't think so, but it could be. I, again, I think, no, I, I, you know, from a, I'm not an economist, uh, but from a supply demand, at some point, you know, to the extent the, I know that the oil rig count is dec declining, at some point that will uh, create a, a floor uh, off of which I would expect, based on just pure fundamentals, uh, the supply is, uh, once the supplies, um, I've been a little uh, tongue-in-cheek here because uh, even though I mentioned, you know, supplies are, are, are increasing and global demand is decreasing and that's a recipe for l lower prices, I, what I, here's, here's what I, one of the things I didn't mention to this, you know, the question, whoever's asking, will frackers go bankrupt? There are other indications of, you know, uh, in, you know, rising demand worldwide. Um, what's going to be of interest, uh, I, I didn't talk as much, I mentioned it, the other major uh, political or, or, or economic event in June, June 23rd, is the decision, you know, uh, while Europe has this uh, negative interest rate environment, to what extent will that begin to stimulate growth in Europe, in the European bloc, uh, and uh, because of the interconnections in the U.S. as well. We're already seeing it here. Um, and as such, I, 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 my, my quick answer is no, I don't expect that they will go bankrupt um, uh, based on it. I understand the thrust of the question, but I don't think in the limit that will occur. All right. Any other questions, guys? I'm almost amazed at myself that this has been, in the scheme of things, one of the shortest uh, webinars. But uh, hopefully you got something out of it. Uh, again, as you see on the screen, oh, great, thank you, thank you, thank you for showing up, and hopefully, uh, if you have any further questions, contact, as you see on the screen, Peter Newman, heads uh, trading, uh, our admissions, um, uh, myself and my coworkers are the mentors that we go into more detail on these things, but uh, more or less, the webinars are presented as a forum by which we can at least present some uh, tips of the proverbial iceberg, as it were, so you can kind of get a gist of what we're talking about. And if you would uh, like more details, uh, you'd have to talk to Peter Newman. And sometimes he, oftentimes in the last few months, he has been arranging for me to talk to people. You can find out more about our programs. Uh, someone's asking, how do I see Brexit affecting? Uh, well, I don't, I happen to think that Europe will, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Great Britain will stay, but I, I think, I, I don't know. But that's that's I do know it's 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 a it's going to be on the uh, horizon as a as a major event in June. I find it. I was looking. You can't torture. I you shouldn't torture the data. But again, I have a major time point for the stock market, June 12. I was trying. I wish I could say to you that that was congruent perfectly right at the same time as the scheduled meeting. I think which is the what did I say? The 23rd. I think of June is when. Uh, they're supposed the Brexit uh, situation is supposed to come to uh, fruit, you know, head. Uh, so it might it's close enough though. But I know that those two that's the next major geopolitical event, I guess. That um, if you're a fundamentalist, uh, and even if you're not, it, that will serve to uh, uh, create some uh, vol rising volatility. So if nothing, how do I think it would affect, uh, you know, to your question, Brad, the market? Well, which market? But I'm assuming you mean the stock market. Certainly. European or you know internet uh, foreign stock sectors I think will become more volatile I think on the banking sector to the extent um, uh, I, I, it, it's going to create short-term volatility is my is my first uh, thought how specifically I, I'd have to look at the charts and go because I don't stay I honestly don't stay up on fundamentals I do sometimes just just hearing the general news but uh, I, I can say in a broad sweep, it will. I can expect it will create volatility, which is good. It creates opportunity. The specific types of opportunity, I don't know, but um, I'm sure it will introduce and impute higher levels of volatility, especially for the foreign uh, equity sectors. And to the extent that's tied into the U.S. market, certainly I expect so. Such. Very good. All right, guys. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your attendance. And hopefully, you, uh, if you have, as I said, more specific, uh, if you're interested in more of uh, the details of the specific programs we offer, you have the contact information. We have recorded today's program, so um, you can also access that out on our website, on the website, uh, pacifictradingacademy.com. Until next time, I wish you the best in, in your trading and uh, overall, and uh, have a profitable a uh, few days and weeks ahead until we meet again. <laughs>
uh, yeah, I use Bra Bradley. Is uh, it's indispensable? Yeah, someone. I I just. Oh yeah, and someone's asking me about Bradley. That's those are uh, astro cycle stuff. Yeah, I'm very big. I learned a lot uh, based on everything he's done. Yes. Okay, guys. Bye bye.